Hi, everybody. Hi, Vance. I have got 8.59 here on my computer, and people are still joining up, which is awesome. And I would encourage everybody to um, turn their video on so that we can make this as social as possible. That's one of the things that I miss about the B College in person is that I don't get to meet y'all and say hi and <clears throat> say hi to Vance and some of the people that have been coming to the B College for a long time. And so go ahead and, and turn your video on if you want and we can be a little bit more social on this. Well, I have nine o'clock on my computer clock. So I wanna welcome everybody to the online version of the Wyoming Bee College Conference. I have, a, it's pretty simple today. I've got Dr. Carolina Nayardi, who's gonna talk about um, introduction to beekeeping, basic beekeeping, biology, bee biology. I have Michael Jordan on. He will talk about different types of hives. I have Dr. David Lewis, who will talk about feeding bees and, and care of bees and once you get them. And then I've got Paul Anderson on to talk to you about, you just bought those bees, you bought a package or a nut, and so now what do you do? So he'll talk about installing and, and that first few weeks of caring for them. If you have questions, please, um, put them in the chat and then I'll interrupt Carolina at appropriate times and I'll ask her the questions. I also uh, will take a break uh, about an hour into the program so everyone can run to the bathroom or get another, get another cup of this. <laughs> and what I would also like is in the chat box, if you all would put in the city and state that you're from. So I'd like to know where everyone is from. So if you would type into the chat, your city and state. And this is also being recorded and it will be archived on the Laramie County Extension webpage. And then I'll put a link in later so that you can find it a little easier. But again, this will be this being recorded, it'll be archived and you can go back to it later. So our first speaker this morning is Dr. Carolina Nayardi and she is, she gets to wear the, the awesome title of veterinarian, master beekeeper and a third generation beekeeper. So she's got a tremendous amount of experience with bees She's been teaching for me for four years now, maybe five. <laughs> time. Don't time know, don't remember. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been, and I, I I love having her, and she's an amazing instructor. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Carolina Nayardi to teach you guys introduction to beekeeping and basic bee biology and all that fun stuff. All right. Carolina, it's yours. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, thank you very much for the invite to be here this morning. I really appreciate that. Um, so we will do a sort of a whirlwind three hour tour on the biology of bees. Even though I will try to cover as much information as I can, there is no way that in three hours you can appropriately cover what amazing creatures honeybees are, but I hope to give you a taste of that. My uh, philosophy has always been as a you know beekeeper, but this obviously applies if you're not a beekeeper either, is that um, the more that you know about your bees and the more that you understand about them and learn about their behavior, the much better you will be as a beekeeper because you will inherently understand what decision-making you should be taking into account to be able to manage um, these amazing creatures as best as you can. And so, so we'll cover various aspects of that. As I said, we'll try to do as much information as we can, but 
uh, despite that attempt, we will fall short and this will really be as fast and brief of an overview as one can do in a three hour time slot. And so Catherine uh, mentioned a little bit about myself. I am a doctor of veterinary medicine. Oftentimes people think my doctorate is in entomology because of my love of honeybees. And that is not the case. I am a vet. Um, I know a little bit about insects. However, I know my passion really is European honeybees and that is what I focus in on. There are many individuals that I have to thank for their contribution to my presentation, including pictures, commentary, et cetera, that are too vast to mention, but I always like to say this is sort of a joint effort. Um, and then I will apologize ahead of time. I will throw a lot of information at you and keep in mind that a lot of the information will be science-based, but much of the commentary is based on my own uh, lifelong experience as a beekeeper. And like so many things in life, you ask uh, five beekeepers the same question. And if you only get six different answers, you are being very lucky because there are so many different ways to think about how to problem solve bees and everyone's understanding of bees that you'll never find two beekeepers that will have the exact same answer to any problem. And that is also a wonderful thing in that it gives you a vast um, tool chest from which to troubleshoot. And so, uh, so let's get started. Let's start at the beginning. So what is a honeybee exactly? If you look at how they're classified, of course, they're animals, they're arthropods, they follow under the insect category. And as you further keep going down uh, your kingdom phylum class classification, you finally end up with the honeybee falling under the genus Apis and the species Mellifera. And so a common um, naming that you'll always see for European honeybees is Apis M, which of course starts, stands for Apis mellifera uh, for the European honeybee. And so let's look a little further as to what that really, uh, what that really means. Um, so when you look at the group of Apis mellifera, the European honeybee, there are also a number of distinctions that you'll sometimes hear. And so I will put these words here just so that you have a little bit of context in case you have heard these words before. So within the Apis mellifera group of European honeybees, there are subspecies or also known as races. And these subspecies are just mild variations that have evolved in various parts of the world to that particular geographic area. Um, the ones that are most notable are listed here. So you will sometimes hear beekeepers discuss having carniolan uh, honeybees or having a preference for Italian honeybees or uh, them thinking that Russian honeybees are superior. And what we're really just talking about are just subgroups of honeybees. They will all interbreed with each other uh, because they're just um, that similar to one another. And to be honest, I always say that in the United States, um, I tend to think of all of these subspecies as not being pure. You know, I always think of carniolan-ish bees or Italian-ish bees that they might have a tendency based on those subgroupings um, for one item or the other. So for example, Italians are always thought of as being kind of a blonder bee and um, that they are, that they like to overwinter in a larger group um, versus carniolans that they will overwinter oftentimes in a smaller cluster uh, as, as well as the Russians, they like to overwinter in a smaller cluster. And so some of these, you might notice these predilections between the bees, but to be honest, my opinion um, is that, um, and the DNA data support it, that many of these are not as pure in the United States. And so I tend to think of them as, as I said, Italian-ish rather than pure Italians. But if you hear those words, we're all still talking about European honeybees. 
So let's talk a little bit more about these classifications. Um, when you look at a honeybee, right, appreciate the fact that they have an exoskeleton on the outside um, that they have, and I'm sorry, I have to ask, can you see my pointer on the slide, uh, Catherine? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that that appears. And so um, they have a segmented body. And so we talk about the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So we have three segments. Um, we also have three pairs of appendages, right? One, two, three. And each one of these is specialized in terms of performing various tasks. And we'll look at that a little closer as we go a few slides over. Uh, of course, they have a pair of antenna. Um, they have two sets of wings, which are challenging to look at here because they do look like one solid unit. And that is a part of the trick that between these two pairs of wings, two sets of wings, they are hooked together by these small hooks called hamuli. And it serves an advantage when the bee is flying to be able to hook those wings together to work as one large wing versus having four independent wings uh, to move. Um, to be in this classification that they fall under, they also have bodies that are completely covered with branched hairs. And so I always think of them as being incredibly furry. I had once read that a poor graduate student was in charge of counting hairs on bees' bodies. And they said that the number of hairs were greater on a bee than the number on a squirrel's body, uh, which I think is somewhat outrageous. Um, of course, they use pollen and nectar as a sole source of food. So whenever um, you know people are pestered and they complain about bees visiting their picnic uh, area, um, particularly if they're barbecuing, I know for sure that they're not honeybees that are coming to visit, but they'll probably be wasps instead because bees really just use pollen and nectar as their source of food. And the European honeybee can only exist socially. You cannot have one or two bees existing by themselves. They exist as a social group. And so as a group, they cooperatively take care of their young. As the group, they are organized so that the reproductive, there's a reproductive division within their caste system. And then of course, in existing socially in order to be a perennial, and I'll put that in quotes, organism, you're going to have to have overlapping generations, right? So no single bee will live for years on end, but as a colony, you can have colonies that might live um, under proper circumstances, have the potential of living in perpetuity because of this overlap in generations. So we're gonna look at these um, specializations of the bee uh, a little bit more closely. And so let's start at the head, right? We talked about how there's three segments. And so let's look at the, the basic anatomy of the head. Bees actually have five eyes on them. So they have two compound eyes, which are these large eyes on either side of the head. They're really uh, used for vision, um, similar to our eyes in terms of being able to see the world around them. Of course, those eyes are compound because they're made of individual hexagonal units. Um, but we'll just look, we'll just think of them as our own eyes in terms of being able to see the world. And aside from that, they also have three small ocelli, which are also eyes at the top of the head. Here you can see one, you can't see the other two. And these are not used for vision in the way that we experience vision, but they're really used to detect uh, ultraviolet and the positioning of the sun, particularly in the sky. Um, and so we're looking at five total heads. Um, the one thing that, you know, you will take note is when you look at these compound eyes that just like the bee is completely furry, there are hairs that are covering these compound eyes as well. And those hairs are really um, used to um, perceive and detect airflow. And so information that is traveling through those hairs by the eye are used by the bee to assist her in navigating 
and being able to judge distance as she is traveling and uh, to be able to um, factor in airflow, if there's crosswinds, headwinds, et cetera, so that she can uh, factor all of these things in to be able to determine how far and how fast uh, she is flying to and fro. Um, this head, of course, also contains other sensory um, uh, you know, appendages. And so the antenna, of which she has two, right, are also used to tell, um, be able to sense smell. So they're used to sort of touch and smell at the same time. And, uh, and they're oftentimes also used in navigation in order to detect the direction of smell. Um, other sort of sensory and appendages within the head area are these mandibles that you'll see in the front here. And they're spoon shaped. They're used for molding things like wax. They can be used to drag dirt or dead bees out of the hive. They're also used for grooming oneself and one another. They can be used as tools for fighting. Um, so these are very important appendages for the bee herself. Um, here you can also see the proboscis and that is basically her tongue. It's made out of three parts and she can um, use them together sort of as a straw when needed, which is what she's using it here. And so of course it's used for ingesting uh, nectar, water, any type of liquids. She will also use this proboscis to exchange food between herself and other bees when they're trying to transmit uh, information between the two of them, whether it's a food source or pheromones, right? They can use their proboscis to do that. Um, and even though this is technically not within the anatomy of the head area, because we are talking about sensory organs, right? I included their feet. Their feet also have taste receptors uh, on them. And so I always find that fascinating that even with their feet, they can uh, sense the world around them. Keep in mind that, you know, their eyes, even though uh, they are used for vision, that um, the wavelengths that bees are able to perceive, the wavelengths are very different than our own. So here are the wavelengths that human eyes perceive. You will notice that the bee has much more of a vision in the ultraviolet spectrum. And so she does see the world with slightly different colors than we do. And so oftentimes when you look at flowers, um, the bee, you know, this is of course an interpretation of what a bee might uh, see because of her wavelengths. When you look at flowers to the bee, the coloring will be very different. And a lot of flowers will have indications to the bee as to where the nectar and the pollen sources are by the way that they are colored. And so, um, things that we do not perceive when we're looking at the flowers. The, the bees certainly do perceive that information and they're directed into the center of the flower uh, where it's most important for the bee to be interacting uh, with the flower uh, itself. So let's look at some of these things that I mentioned to you uh, anatomically that are just so fascinating with the bee. Uh, I mentioned to you that the wings are hooked together with these hamuli. And so if you look very closely here, you will see these hooks that are used to um, um, hook the front and the back wing together. Um, here is a close up of her hairs. And so I mentioned to you that they're branched. So it's hairs upon hairs upon hairs, making her the ultimate in static cling. So as she approaches these flowers, of course, that static cling will um, be important in attracting these pollen grains onto her body so that she, of course, acts as effectively as she can as a pollinator, but also, too, in terms of trapping pollen that she can then remove um, and take home with her uh, as a food source. Here's the, a, a close up of the top of her head. And so you can see one ocelli, two ocelli, three ocelli at the top of her head um, peeking out at you. A close up of that, those hairs, they're single, obviously not branched. So they're more like stiff bristles 
that exist on her compound eyes. And then I mentioned to you that um, she has three pairs of um, app you know, appendages and that each of them have their own function. And so here are some minor modifications or major modifications that you will see on those appendages that really make them quite unique. Uh, so on her forelegs, she has an area that is an antenna cleaner, perfectly shaped for her to be able to pick and clean her antennae. And as these are uh, serving as her sensory uh, organ, she wants to keep them um, nice and clean to be able to get the latest information through those antennae. If you're looking at further back on her legs, she has a pollen press. And so as she grooms herself from the pollen that has statically clung on her body, she can then use this pollen press to press those individual grains of pollen together. And then furthermore, they will then be put on these pollen baskets on her hind legs and these little rakes of hair will trap the pollen pellet onto that hind leg so that she's able to carry and transport um, that pollen back to the hive with her. So let's continue looking at a few more uh, anatomical features um, on the head itself. Another prominent characteristic that is located on the uh, head of bees particularly young bees, not, um, this is most developed in younger bees, and we'll talk a little bit more about that further on, are hypopharyngeal glands. And so they're located on the sides of the head and they're really used, um, they are, the production of the material from these glands is stimulated by the consumption of pollen. And these glands, of course, produce the royal jelly, which is this white substance that is used to feed the young larvae of bees. Um, it is fed to all larvae, particularly those that are less than four days old. And of course, it's also fed to the developing larvae of queens cells, which is what is pictured here below. But we'll talk a little bit further about the development of um, bees when we get to that section of bee biology. Bees, of course, also have normal anatomy that we're familiar with with other animals. And so they have a digestive system like the rest of us do. It's a little bit more specialized in that, of course, they have a mouth, they have an esophagus that eventually leads to a crop or what we also can call their honey stomach. It's not a true stomach. It really is a storage organ upon which they can um, store nectar that they are retrieving from the flowers and they will store it there as they are traveling home. And so once they get home, they're able to regurgitate that nectar from that crop honey stomach uh, onto a nest mate with the, within the hive that will then further process that nectar and turn it into honey. Um, and so bees uh, also have their own gut contained within the midgut. And then furthermore, they also have an intestine and a rectum um, as well. So when we continue on, they also have a circulatory system, a little different than what we're familiar with. Um, they have an open uh, circulatory system and their version of blood is called hemolymph and it travels more sort of as an open, within the open cavity of the bee themselves, but just be aware that they do have a circulatory system. Uh, they have multiple hearts along this system to help move this fluid along throughout their body. They also have a respiratory system. They don't have any lungs, um, but they do have air sacs and um, trachea and spiracles, which are tubes that assist in um, doing air exchange from the outside to the inside of the bee. And in order to accomplish that, they of course have openings um, 
along that exoskeleton to allow and facilitate for the air exchange that happens. Uh, likewise, they have a nervous system with a brain and then uh, several ganglia that act as nerve centers uh, within the bee itself. And then one important aspect of anatomy too that we need to recognize that I think a lot of people don't think about is that bees also have fat bodies. And so it's not only stored for energy purposes for themselves in terms of fat, but of course, I think that in the long term, we will also uh, study these fat bodies more closely and find out that they have huge impacts on uh, the immune system themselves of bees and also potentially to a lot of the hormones that may be regulating uh, within the bee and the immune system will very likely be closed, will be tied in very closely to the fat bodies of bees themselves. Um, we also look at these fat bodies because they're really important in bees to determine um, the longevity of bees between summer and winter bees. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to those sections. Um, and there are some diseases too, for example, varroa mites that will be discussed in, a, in another section in terms of bee diseases, um, that um, varroa mites are mites that are particularly interested in feeding not only on the hemolymph of bees, but most importantly on the fat bodies of the bees themselves. And so it's a uh, parasite that really targets in on the fat bodies of bees. When we look at that midsection of the bees in terms of the abdomen, we also can't forget the wonderful thing that bees produce besides honey, which is wax. And so this is a picture of the underside of the bees. You have these abdominal plates here that are part of the bee themselves. And in between these abdominal plates is where wax is produced. Of course, it's a liquid to begin with. And as, as, as it is extruded between these abdominal plates and it hits the outer environment, um, that liquid of course becomes more solid and it becomes the wax that the bees are using uh, in order to uh, create the world in which they live in. Um, Wax is very, very energy intensive. Um, I once read that it takes about eight pounds of nectar to produce about a pound of honey. Um, I don't know, it, it, you know uh, what the caloric expenditure there is, but you can appreciate how much energy really goes into producing wax that is a highly um, energy dependent activity. And the bees that are most um, avid in producing wax within the hive are also bees that tend to be um, about 10 days, two weeks old in that age range. And of course, you have to have a large amount of food resources coming into the hive and uh, in a temperature range in the 90s really to promote um, the bee's desire um, to really kick wax production into high, into high gear. As we look further down into the abdomen, of course, we can't forget that bees have the lovely uh, defensive strategy of a stinger. It is not carried by all cast members, and we'll talk about that as we look at the casts within the hive but just appreciate that not all members within the hive um, do have a stinger. The stinger is barbed and that is important because it's really geared towards um, being retained in mammal skin. Um, that barb does not stick in insect skin. So if you had to, if you had two bees that were stinging one another, right? They don't lose their stinger within each other's body. We're the only uh, mammals are the only ones that are privileged enough for which um, the stinger's barb gets stuck within our skin. And when it does so, of course, then the muscular venom sac is activated and starts pulsating venom into our skin. Um, at the time that the bees sting us, they also leave a pheromone behind that will persist in the area of the sting. And of course that 
pheromone is a chemical signal that communicates to other bees uh, that this individual has been stung and it's um, a way of alerting them what it is that um, they're targeting um, and they should be targeting as a group. And then keep in mind too that anytime you are stung with the stinger because of its barbed presence and the fact that the venom sac remains that you don't ever want to squeeze that venom sac in the hopes of removing the stinger that you always want to scrape that stinger away um, so that you're able to hopefully scrape it without releasing more of the venom uh, onto your skin as you're removing it. So now that we have looked at some of just the basic anatomy of what makes a bee a bee, why don't we move into something that is far more interesting um, to discuss, which is the, who are all these individuals that possess these wonderful characteristics uh, inside the hive itself? So let's talk about the cast. We, who are all the cast members that are within the hive themselves? We'll start, of course, with the queen. Um, I tend to think of her as those individuals that get a very um, charming name, but their job is really not that charming. And so, um, so she gets a very high title, yet what she does is not as glamorous as it sounds. Um, there's usually only one within the hive. I have a question mark there because occasionally you do have situations where you might for a short time order uh, find two within a hive, a mother and a daughter that may coexist for a short time together. Um, it doesn't happen as frequently, but it certainly can happen. Um, but generally speaking, there should only be one queen within that hive herself. She too has three body segments like all of her bees, but this is one aspect that distinguishes her when you're looking into the hive to try to identify her. She has a head area. She has a thorax. However, her thorax is bald. And so that is a very identifying characteristic about her is that bald thorax. If you compare her to her um, you know, half sister next to her, you will see she's nice and furry in the thorax area, but the queen herself is not. Um, she also has a very long abdomen in comparison to the other members of that hive. And so, of course, she is the reproductive member of the hive. She's the only one that hopefully will be laying uh, eggs for the future generations. And so in order to do that, she needs to have that large abdomen uh, to house the ovaries, um, to uh, be able to produce all the eggs. So she will have a very long abdomen. So between the ball thorax and the long abdomen, she is very distinguishable within that hive herself. She is genetically the same as all the other female workers within the hive. And so she will be half sisters to some of the members within the hive. And of course she will be mother to all the rest of the members in the hive. And how she develops is the following in that um, she has developed from a fertilized egg. So the previous queen will have laid a fertilized egg. And if the hive has determined that they need to raise queens, what happens to that fertilized egg is that it is fed a very uh, nutritious and longer term um, food from the nurse bees that contains that royal jelly. And in feeding those selected eggs, and larvae because the eggs don't consume any food, but the larvae that develops from the eggs do. In feeding that larvae um, nutritious food for a longer time period, that induces and promotes these larvae to then um, start developing the ability to have a fully functioning reproductive tract. And so from those larvae, of course, they will go through the pupal stage and then eventually become fully formed adult bees. And in those select individuals that were fed a much richer um, diet 
um, during the larval stages is what turns them into queens. So they were selected and reared to become queens. And of course, we as beekeepers, um, having that knowledge, are able to use that to rear our own queens um, for production purposes. Because she does have that larger body during development, she also develops in larger cells within the hive itself. And so here you will see what a queen's uh, chamber looks like as she's going through the pupil stage. Is It's much larger to accommodate for that larger body that she is. Um, her tasks, of course, are specialized given that she is the queen of her hive. And what really that means is that she's an egg laying machine. And that is what she is uh, created to do. At the peak, she might lay about 1,500 eggs per day. And hopefully a good queen in her lifetime might make it to laying about a million eggs in her lifetime. And so that really is all that she is geared towards doing is just laying eggs. Um, her other tasks, which are related to that, is that as the queen, she produces a variety of pheromones, which I mentioned to you are chemical signals. And those chemical signals uh, dictate a lot of the activity that goes within the hive. I won't talk much about that now. We will talk about that a little bit more um, as we go on in the presentation. But when I think of the queen, those are the activities that I think are most important to her. One is her ability to produce um, members in that hive. So her egg laying ability, but also to the ability to produce these chemical signals that dictate uh, a lot of the work that goes in that hive. Um, as the queen, she only leaves the hive twice, perhaps twice in her lifetime. Once for sure, the second time is questionable. And so let's assume that you have a hive where the clumsy beekeeper has crushed the existing queen. The bees realize that they are without a queen and will designate a number of these eggs or very early larvae to be developed into a subsequent queen and they start feeding her the appropriately rich food to induce the full development of her reproductive organs. And now, of course, she has gone through the pupil stage and emerged as a young queen into the hive. Um, she, of course, is born a virgin and is not fully mated. And in order for her to mate, she will have to leave her hive. And so she leaves the hive for multiple, you know, on multiple days. Um, to look for various mating opportunities. And so she will mate several times before she then uh, commits herself to staying in the hive to really take on the responsibility of being queen and start laying eggs. And so that's one time when she will leave the hive is to go out and mate. Um, from that moment on, she will never leave the hive again because her job really is to stay within the hive and lay eggs. Um, the only other opportunity that you might have to leave the hive is if that hive in subsequent seasons is large enough where now we have to divide the hive into two. And so the moment that that happens, of course, swarming, you know, during swarming season, that may be another opportunity for the existing queen to leave the hive with a swarm to start a new colony. But generally speaking, uh, aside from the swarming episode, once the queen is done mating, she will stay in the hive and never leave it again um, and complete her tasks without the hive, uh, um, complete her tasks within the hive as the queen. Um, the other thing that makes the queen slightly interesting for all the other um, bees within the hive itself is that she has the longest lifespan. So she is able to live for several years. Um, we used to think of queens as perhaps being three or four years old within the hive themselves. And certainly they have the ability to live that long. Um, the impacts, however, um, are that, um, that is dependent on her performance. And so uh, even though she could technically live that long, um, if her performance is not up to par as she ages, 
The hive, of course, will take necessary steps to remove her and replace her with a better performing, younger, reproductive individual uh, if that is needed. Or of course, uh, we as beekeepers too will assess our hives from year to year. And we, we wanna ensure that we have very strong, healthy hives. And in order to have strong hives with high proportion of individuals within the hive, we need to have a queen that is up to the task of really doing her job well. And of course, the moment that she no longer is performing that service well, we as beekeepers might choose to remove her and replace her with a younger queen in order to appropriately um, do that task. Um, but um, as I said, keep in mind that technically she is able to live um, for many years. Unlike some of the other bees within her colony, she also has a stinger, but her stinger is not barbed. Um, it's very rare for a queen to have to technically defend her hive. Um, and so, the functions of that barb stinger, of course, for her are quite different. She will use that stinger against other competitors. So as I mentioned to you, let's say you have a situation where um, you as the beekeeper have uh, accidentally crushed your queen and you didn't know it. Um, and the bees have taken note of that and taken steps to um, raise additional queens to find a replacement. They of course are very practical. And instead of raising just one queen as a replacement, they hedge their bets. And so they will um, develop a number of queens to hopefully have one that will take over that hive. And what may ensue is that you might have two or three queens that are um, um, leaving, um, you know, going through metamorphosis and entering the hive as young queens. Um, and they're all sort of simultaneously within the hive itself where you can have two queens battling one another to the death. And those are the time periods where they might use that stinger against each other as they're battling to see who the reigning queen will be. In the process of doing so, of course, any queen will travel as best as she can throughout the hive and even seek out competitors that might still be in the pupil stage within this queen cup developing. And she might choose to take out her competitors by stinging through that queen cell itself to get rid of her competitors. And so that really is the purpose of her stinger um, is to, to be able to do that. You know, she of course, like all individuals cannot live alone. Um, she has to live within the hive itself. She is taken care of by the rest of the hive. And, but likewise, the hive cannot survive without her they need a queen in order to be able to produce the next generations to take that hive from one season to the next. So here's a picture of her uh, reproductive structures. You see that she has these gigantic ovaries, right? She is the reproductive member of the hive itself. Um, another interesting feature that she only she has is a spermatheca, which is the area that is right here. And that specialized structure holds all of the um, sperm packets that she collects when she goes off in her mating flights. I mentioned to you that she will only leave once in her lifetime as a virgin queen, and she will mate with multiple males during various mating flights. So she'll go out over several days on several flights to mate. Uh, the hope is that she will mate hopefully on average with about 15 individuals. And so as she is mating with those individuals, she's collecting these sperm packets and these are being stored in the spermatheca and the spermatheca will maintain these sperm as viable units for several years if she is to live for that long and act as the reproductive queen within that hive. 
Um, it's estimated that she's able to hold about 7 million sperm in her spermatheca. So that really speaks to her, her potential longevity in terms of being uh, the reproductive queen within the hive. So who else do we find that? Because obviously it's not just gonna be the queen within the hive itself. Um, the main group that you find within that hive really are the workers. Uh, I call them the girls. They're really the bulk of the individuals that you find within that hive. And of course, the name says it all, they are the workers. They do all of the work that needs to get done within the hive. Um, when we think about their development, um, they too are females. Mm -hmm. And what that means from a bee's perspective is that they are also um, raised from fertilized eggs. Not all individuals within the hive are raised from fertilized eggs, which is um, why I keep mentioning that these are all fertilized eggs. And so anytime a queen bee lays an egg, she can determine whether to fertilize it or not, um, provided that she still has sperm within the spermatheca to do so. And so if she fertilizes the egg, that egg is determined to develop into a female. Of course, she can either develop into a queen if fed appropriately, if the need is there, or if raised under natural, normal conditions, they will develop into the workers within the hive. And so all of the workers in the hive are fertilized eggs, so they develop into females. Um, they're, of course, all related to one another as either full sisters or half sisters, given that the queen has mated with multiple males, right? So some will share the same genetics and some will only be 50% related to one another. Um, because they are females and they have developed from a fertilized egg, they do have um, a reproductive potential. They are female. They are they do retain the ability to lay eggs. However, unlike the queen, because they don't develop fully, they do not have the ability to mate and retain sperm and fertilize their eggs. And so they are able to lay eggs. Those eggs will never be fertilized because they do not have the ability to do so. And even though they are able to lay eggs under most hive conditions, they do not. So they are, under most circumstances, a non-reproductive unit of the hive, but the ability remains. And there are circumstances where this ability is unleashed in the hive and they do lay eggs, but that is not the normal course of events. Um, um, when we discuss the pheromones that are released by the queen, that's one of the ways by which the um, workers are kept from laying eggs and reproducing in the hive. But just be aware, the potential is there. It's just not the full potential of reproduction of the queen, but they have the ability to lay eggs. Uh, because they are the main contributors to the hive, right? They are the bulk of the population within the hive anywhere from two to 60,000 individuals within that hive will all be the worker population. They are essential to the hive. They do all of the work. Their work is divided by age. We'll look at what the sequence of events are. It's highly organized society. And, um, and so the organization of the work that they do is very regulated within the hive itself. And they, of course, are the lovely beneficiaries of the barbed singer. And so their main function, too, is um, in terms of defending and protecting the hive. But let's look at closely as to what are these um, tasks that the workers do within the hive itself. So the work that the bees are able to do within the hive is somewhat regulated by their age. Um, when they first emerge from the hive, we think of them as um, house bees. And so some of those tasks that they're relegated early on in their life as house bees 
maybe to clean out the cells in the comb and they will go in there, clean everything and they leave behind the, um, I always call it sort of the, the, the squeaky clean scent to let the queen know that yes, this individual cell has been cleaned, it's ready to be used. She can go ahead and lay a fresh egg in that cell and um, it's, it's ready for that task. They will also clean any dirt or debris that's within that hive and take it outside. And of course, I'll remind you, they have those lovely mandibles on their head in order to do so. Um, at some point during the nurse bee development stages, there will be nurse bees. They will feed all the developing larvae within their hive. And um, at that age, which is normally around 10, 9, 10 days of age, they have the highest ability of using the hypopharyngeal glands that we discussed that are along the head in order to produce the royal jelly to feed those young developing larvae. Um, and so that is a task that those young bees really are anatomically primed and ready to do. Um, thereafter, after they have gone through the nurse bee stage, they might be uh, nectar receivers. And so they'll go towards the entry of the hive awaiting for one of the foragers to come back with their crop full of nectar and of course, those foragers are busy going out and collecting that nectar. They don't want to be spending time within the hive to find places to deposit that nectar and start working on its conversion to honey. And so these young bees might act as receiver bees where they're hanging out in the hive. They're waiting for those foragers to come in. And then, of course, uh, through their proboscis, they will transfer nectar from the forager bee coming home onto themselves, and then they can go to the appropriate areas within the hive uh, in order to start depositing that nectar uh, that is going to be transformed into honey. Um, after a certain amount of time has gone by, right, they might become, their duties might evolve into becoming a guard bee. And these are all the bees that will be stationed in the entries or openings within the hive itself. Their duty at that point is to monitor to seeing who's coming and going within the hive. And so they will a lot of times position themselves on these openings and lift their front legs. And I mentioned to you that they have taste receptors within those feet. And of course, they can use their antenna as well. And they're going to be monitoring the coming and going of any individual within that hive. And what they're really wanting to do is to detect from the odor of that bee that is returning, is she one of the nest mates? Does she carry the right odor to let them know that she belongs within that hive itself? Itself. Uh, and of course, in doing so, they're guarding to seeing that no other bee that is foreign um, is entering the hive for um, ulterior purposes, such as robbing the hive of the goods that they have collected. They, of course, will be guarding against other invaders, be it wasps, um, humans, bears, you know, you name it, that is their duty. And then of course, the final stage that all bees hopefully will result in is that they become foragers. They're the girls that will go out and will start collecting uh, what is needed within the hive itself. And so, you know, by going through these various tasks, you know, you will appreciate that there is a developmental sequence to moving from one to the other. Part of it is dictated by the needs of the hive. And so if the hive has enough, um, let's say nurse bees for that time being, then of course they will develop faster into a forager bee um, than going through all of these sequences one by one. However, one of the challenges is the fact that some of these tasks are really ideally suited to a bee of a particular age. And so I keep going back to those hypopharyngeal glands. You know, young bees have those hypopharyngeal glands in fully functioning form. Once a bee gets old enough where she's of a foraging age, those hypopharyngeal glands have shrunken and they are not fully functional as they were in those younger days. And so a foraging bee does not have the same ability 
to go back in time to do some of these functions. And that's something that as beekeepers, we have to be very mindful of that um, one bee is not the same as the other, that age does uh, uh, affect some of their abilities um, in, in, in what they can do for the hive themselves. So when we talk about these foragers, what are all the things that they actually need to bring to the hive? Uh, pollen, that's a huge um, factor that needs to be brought into the hive. It's their main source of protein. And of course contains um, you know, trace minerals and other minerals, but it's really their source, sole source of protein to be brought back within the hive. And that's where those lovely branched hairs really come into focus, that the static cling will help them collect the extra pollen granules that they then will brush off, use those pollen presses within the leg that we were able to look at, and then further put into the pollen baskets to bring home. And you can appreciate the diversity of color of pollen um, that bees can bring home at any time period. And you can also see it within this picture of them carrying the pollen on their hind legs back home. And of course, here's a close up of what that would look like um, if you were look, looking at those fully loaded pollen baskets. I really love looking inside the hive at the collection of pollen that they have accumulated. I have seen anything from a white gray color to something that is a purple black and every red and orange in between. Um, a burgundy, I mean, it's just amazing the variety of a color of pollen that these um, girls are able to bring home. If of course that pollen is available in their surrounding environment, right? That we're not living in an area of a monoculture where that is not available. The other next component that is uh, brought into the hive of high importance is of course nectar. Uh, nectar is produced in the flowers themselves. It's very high in moisture. It's very high in sugars. It also of course will contain plant pigments and other minerals as well that are used uh, within the hive. And um, because it's such an important component um, for bees to bring home, um, keep in mind that um, you know bees have uh, this amazing ability to recognize flowers by the color and the smell of the nectar that they produce. And that's one way that bees are just such amazing pollinators is that of course, the pollination happens as a payment for their um, collecting the nectar of flowers. So the flowers are luring the bees to them with the, with the promise of this sweet nectar. And in collecting that, the bees are able to pollinate uh, those flowers. But um, this attraction that the bees have to this nectar um, is very um, dependent on the quality of the nectar themselves. And so bees in collecting the nectar are able to recognize the food value of one nectar in comparison to another and have a preference for one over the other based on that um, nutritious component within the nectar itself. Um, propolis is another ingredient, um, so to speak, that bees bring home. And propolis is really a combination of tree saps and resins that the bees will um, bring home that that serves many functions. And so propolis will be used to close off any openings within the hive itself. It's like the bee glue, right? Their, their ability to close any small openings within the hive. If they have something in the hive that is too big to be taken out, that is seen as um, something dirty or garbage, they will do, they will cover it in propolis. They will encapsulate it in order to um, separate it from the hive itself. Propolis too has a lot of antibacterial and antifungal properties. And so it's also used to coat the inside of the hive 
almost to give them sort of the first skin of immunity within the hive itself. And so it's just a wonderful material for all of those reasons. But think of it too, from the um, immunity perspective, you know, beekeepers oftentimes see propolis as a nuisance. It gums everything up, your tools, your gloves, especially in the heat of summer, when you're going inside the hive and manipulating it. And a lot of beekeepers are very insistent on removing that propolis to try to make things easier for themselves in terms of their ability to move things within the hive. And I always remind beekeepers the purpose of the propolis that aside from gluing things to together and to use it to close openings, that it really serves as that first skin of immunity within the hive. And so we should really encourage to try to maintain as much propolis within the hive as possible, uh, even to the point that some uh, beekeepers, such as Marla Spivak, have advocated that when we receive hardware within the hive, um, that we should roughen up the interior of the wooden hardware before putting it together with um, uh, you know, rough sandpaper to encourage the bees to lay a layer of propolis on the interior of the hive as they would on the interior of tree cavities because of the fact that it provides that first layer of immunity within the hive itself. Uh, the last item that bees will actively collect and bring home, of course, is water. Just like all creatures, right, they rely on water just for, ba you know, basic survival. Um, so it aids just in homeostasis of the bees and the hive itself. It's used to dilute honey uh, to make it easier to use. It is, of course, used in all of their body secretions. And very importantly, in our area as well, it's used to humidify the developing brood to keep them from desiccating and for cooling the hive during the summer. And so they will transport water home and they will lay, if necessary, because of temperature, water droplets within the hive itself that they then fan with the power of their wings to bring air within the hive. Um, to act as a cooling unit. And so they do this amazing job in using water to cool off their hives, to maintain that high level of humidity that brood need in order for proper development. So now we talked about two members within that hive, right? The queen and the workers. And we have one last cast member that we need to include in the hive itself. And that is the drone. And so the drone is the male, the male within the hive. Um, here you see him pictured. He is, as boys should be, bigger, huskier than their sisters. Um, so he has a much larger body than the girls do. Another aspect that um, it is so distinguishable uh, with him are his large eyes. So if you look at his head, right, he too has a head, thorax, and abdomen. If you look at his head, his head is mainly comprised of just two gigantic eyes. Now, of course, he does have ocelli as well, but when you look at those compound eyes between the two of them, that almost seems like his entire head. And that really um, points to an important aspect is that he needs to have those large eyes to be able to do his function. And the only function that he really has with those big eyes is for mating. And so um, I think of the life of a drone as the life of an irresponsible freshman college boy. And so to all of you men listening, please, I apologize ahead of time. I don't, I don't mean to paint you in a bad light, but that's how I think of these. So this is the life of the drone. They wake up in the morning uh, and they walk around the hive and they beg for food. They do not feed themselves. So they will look around and they'll go up to workers and they will beg to be fed their breakfast, uh, which they are fed. And about 11 o'clock or so, it's time for them to leave the house, right? Because they're late risers. They're not the workers. They don't need to be out at six o'clock in the morning when the sun starts shining. And so about 11 o'clock in the morning, it's time for them to leave home. And so they will exit the hive 
and they will go hang out in these areas that we call drone congregation areas. And so these are areas in the environment that are repeatable year after year. So there must be something about the lay of the land that is very attractive to drones. And so I think of them as the local bar. So they go to these bar drone congregation areas and the boys are all hanging out together, uh, talking smack between one another. And what they are doing as they're hanging out in these bars is, of course, they're waiting for the cute chick to come by, right? So with their big eyes, they're scanning the environment, and they are waiting for a virgin queen to maybe come by, right? And of course, if they see a virgin queen sort of flying in the horizon, they all start chasing her, right? Um, it's sort of the um, the one girl with the many guys that have been hanging out at the bar, right? So they all start chasing her uh, in the hopes of catching her. What they don't realize, right, is that there's a dirty trick to be played on them at hand, which is the first boy that catches her and is able to mate with her in the process of mating. Um, he uh, will mate with her and in the throes of passion, his body will fall off uh, from her, leaving behind you know, his reproductive structure within the queen herself, and the rest of his body will fall off into the ground and he will die in bliss. Um, and so he has done his duty and that's the end of the story. Meanwhile, the rest of the guys that weren't lucky to catch the girls, will kind of go back to hang out in the drone congregation area. And given that they felt that they were really unlucky at bar number one, they might then fly to the next drone congregation area. And so they'll do some bar hopping via various drone congregation areas that are all sort of in close proximity to one another, hoping that maybe at bar number two, they might get lucky if they didn't get done with bar number one. Well. By early afternoon, four or five o'clock, right? If they haven't gotten lucky, uh, they've hung out in the bar long enough, it's time to go home. And so they will fly home uh, for the rest of the day. The problem is, is because they've been hanging out at the bar in the afternoon, uh, several bars, as a matter of fact, they might fly back to their house However, if you have several hives in one location, they might accidentally fly into the wrong hive, right? I mean, they've had one too many beers out there in the drone congregation area, so it gets a little, their GPS gets a little fussy in getting back home. Um, luckily though, however, is if they land in the wrong hive, the guard bees that are at the front do obviously recognize that these lost irresponsible boys landed in the wrong location, but they're benevolent enough that they know that the drone is not there to harm the hive in any way. He's not gonna rob them or anything else. He's kind of a helpless drunk little boy. And so they just kind of shoo him in for the night knowing that the next morning he'll be off and maybe that time he will find his way home. And uh, so they come back home and once again, they will um, beg for food and um, get fed for the night and, and that way they can remain. Um, and so in telling you this, one of the things that you have to appreciate is one of the reasons that they are let into the wrong hive is the fact that they are helpless creatures. They do not do any work in terms of bringing any food resources or anything home. They don't have those modifications on their body like a worker bee has in order to transport pollen home, et cetera, et cetera. The only modification, so to speak, that they have is the ability to mate. And so they don't have any of those developmental features that females have. And because of that, they don't even have a stinger. So when you look at their rear end, I always call them fuzzy butts, because when you look at the tail end of the male drone, it's a rounded body shape. It's not tapered like a female worker or even tapered like the queen would have. It's a much rounded body shape. It's encircled by hairs. 
And so in essence, um, it looks different. And so those are some of the features to look at when you're trying to decide, is this a worker bee? Is this a drone? Is this a queen? Is to look at those body features. So let's once again, look at these males, right? When you look at them, they're much larger than their sisters or a mother. They have those big eyes at the top of their head. And that's a very distinguishing feature about them. Their bodies are much huskier. And when you look at the last segment of their abdomen, instead of having a pointed end, it's very, very rounded. Um, their, um, their numbers vary depending on the time of the year. So I always think of bees as practical. When people ask me questions, what would a bee do? I always say, well, what would be the most practical girl thing to do? Um, and so it would make no sense to have drones in the middle of winter. They serve no purpose at that point in time. And so they're very, they are produced in early spring, just as the pollen and the nectar season is uh, starting to get going in that area because you want to have males present, particularly during spring when hives that have overwintered and are strong might need to swarm and you're gonna be developing new queens that need partners to mate with. And so you'll start seeing their numbers appearing in the springtime. They'll hang around the entire summer in order for there to be mating opportunities if there is a need for it. You will still see them in the fall time period. But of course, as uh, spring moves into summer, moves into fall, you will see less of them being developed in a normal hive because of course, hive, um, what the hive is doing is really dependent as to what's going on in the environment. And so once you get into the fall time period, right, mating opportunities are becoming slimmer and that's where the next a reality check, so to speak, comes in for these little boys. As we're starting to go from fall into winter time and the need of mating is decreasing at that point, one lovely afternoon when they're coming back to the bar and they're heading home, um, the guard bees have all decided that it's gonna be a really cold night coming up, terrible night for those little boys to be outside, but they're knowing that winter is coming. And so they're gonna start preventing those drones from entering the hive, whether it's their own legitimate hive or the accidental hive that they have traveled to, they will be prevented from coming inside. And so over that very cold night temperature, uh, as the little drones are hanging on outside, hoping to get in, right? They're all gonna be frozen and die. Uh, and that's the way that um, nature and the hive will eliminate these males at the end of the season because it's unnecessary to house them, feed them, and keep them over the winter time period. Um, and so that is really the life of a drone. It's a seasonal existence for them. They're going to die either mating or they're going to die at the end of the season if they didn't do their job. Now, the one thing that I want to mention that, um, you know, people think about is that, of course, uh, be mindful of this, that drones and queens do not mate within the hive itself, right? All of these mating activities are occurring outside in these drone congregation areas. And so by not mating in the hive itself, you of course are preventing inbreeding from occurring, right? So even if you have a virgin queen walking around in that hive and you have drones present, they do not mate under those circumstances. They mate in these drone congregation areas. So that's one way of preventing inbreeding, right? It's not happening at home, it's happening out there. The other way that we prevent inbreeding under these circumstances is that the drones that live that leave a given apiary will travel a certain distance in order to find these drone congregation areas. Queens that are leaving those same areas will travel a different distance to go visit drone congregation areas. And so by doing that, right, and I always say, which of course is a simplistic way of looking at it and it's not correct, is that when the drones exit, they go right and the queen exits, she goes left, 
right? And that is one way of just ensuring that the queens leaving a given area will not be visiting the same drone congregation areas that the males that are leaving those same hives are visiting. And this way too, we're preventing inbreeding between brothers and sisters um, because they are visiting different areas in order to perform their reproductive uh, abilities. Um, a picture here on the slide in the bottom, right, is a side-by-side -side comparison of the three individuals. And so, of course, on the far left, you have the worker, females raised from fertilized eggs. You will see that they have uh, usually hair on their thorax. Of course, that hair will, will uh, be shed over time, right? As they get older, they lose some of their hair, just like we do. But in theory, right, they don't have a bald thorax. They have a furry thorax. Right, they're the smallest individual that have a pointed abdomen, right? Because here they have that barbed stinger. The next individual that you see pictured is the drone, the male of the group. He was developed from an unfertilized egg. And so the moment that the queen lays an unfertilized egg, he, that egg is destined to be developed into a male. And that is how we produce males and females within the hive. And so of course you can tell that he's much larger in body than his sister is. Um, in this picture, it's a little harder to tell because they're preserved specimens, but his eyes basically just cover the entire head area. And so that's a very prominent feature. His size is a very prominent feature. And then also too, when you look at the end of his abdomen, right? It's kind of flat or maybe rounded. Uh, it's kind of furry, right? It's not nice and tapered as the females are. So that's another way that they're very easily distinguishable uh, from the other nest mates. And then finally, of course, here we have the queen. You cannot appreciate her bald thorax because of course she's a marked queen. And that is something that we take advantage of as beekeepers is because of the presence of that bald thorax, it does give us the ability to mark them with paint. Um, and we do so in order to uh, be able to verify that the queen in that hive is the queen that we as beekeepers have installed in that hive. It also allows us to monitor the age of the queen. There's a color sequence that we all agree upon using every year, right? And so I don't know it by, hand, by off the top of my head, you know, so I will be making this up, but you know, let's say year zero, zero is white, zero, one, red, you know, zero, two is blue, and that sequence will repeat itself. Um, and so in essence, when you look at the color of the queen, it's very easy to know, oh yeah, she's last year's model, or she's two years old, et cetera, if you are in the habit of marking your queens. Um, and so of course, going back, right, the distinguishing characteristic for her is that she has that bald thorax, very noticeable. And then of course, when you look at her body, right, she's the longest individual. She needs that long abdomen uh, where she has all the eggs stored. And, uh, and of course, she'll have that much longer abdomen, making her the much longest individual within the hive itself. Um, we'll look at a few slides uh, and we're going to play who is that, right? And I want you all to look at the picture, make a determination. Are we looking at a drone? Are we looking at a worker? Are we looking at a queen? And then once we get through that slide set, let's take a break so everybody can refill their coffee cups or do a, a bathroom run. So let's go through these fairly quickly. Uh, here is just, uh, before we go there, is the um, a, a drone and you can see his very large eyes mating with this queen in flight. Um, I'm always amazed that anybody is able to capture that, right? But this is um, just an awesome image that I wanted to share uh, of that act uh, taking place. And so here's just a quick review, right? Little cheat sheet, right? You can, you have a worker sitting right next to the queen so you can really appreciate how different a fully formed queen is from the worker herself. All right. Let's play Name That Cast. Okay. 
So we have a drone, right, in flight. Um, since you can't tell size-wise who he is, look at those gigantic eyes, right? That's one great feature of him. Look at the fuzzy blend. It's flat, it's fuzzy, full of hairs. There's no stinger there. If you were actually in the bee yard, you would know this guy is coming at you because to me, they sound like B2 bombers. They just have a buzz that is so different from the, the gentle buzz that the girls have. They sound so loud. And a lot of times too in flight, they're kind of almost unsteady. Um, and they're a little bit clumsy when they're flying. And so I just think of them as like the B-2 bomber coming at you. Um, but as I said, we, we don't get all those uh, extra assistance in this slide. So we, here we have a worker, not a queen. Um, many things are the telltale. Sign. So we know it's not a drone because look at the eyes, right? They're not overwhelming the entire body. The thorax is covered in hair. So right there, I already know she is not the queen, but just by that feature itself. Here's the other feature. She's feeding herself. And uh, queens are also not in the habit of doing that. Uh, and neither are drones. Right. So here we had some sort of cheater things to kind of help you guide you into, you know, who is it that we are looking at. Okay, big tip off here. Look at them big eyes. Right. Can't be anything but a drone. Uh, Again, if you were in doubt on the big eyes that, as I said, they almost go from one side to the other. You can always look at the thorax, right? It's full of hair, certainly not gonna be the queen. We can't see his behind, so we can't use that as a guide, um, but in essence, between the eyes and the thorax, right? Um, tells you it's not the queen and it's gotta be, and it's not a worker because of those big eyes. So of course here we're looking at a queen, right? A nice bald thorax, kind of shiny. She's a younger queen, um, already has sort of a longer body, not quite as long as I would expect as I would expect to see, but long enough, right? If you look at the space between the end of her wings and the end of her body, there's quite some distance there. You don't see that with workers. Um, and so, of course, we are looking at, uh, at a lovely young queen. And then, of course, this is my ringer, right? No honeybee at all. We're looking at a fly. Um, and so lovely color patterning that looks like she should be a honeybee, but she is not. Very short antennae. And then of course, biggest telltale, right, is the fact that she doesn't have two sets of paired wings. Um, and so just needed to throw that in to see if you were all kind of paying attention. Now, of course, it's easy enough when you see them as individuals, right, which you're not gonna get to see when you're looking inside of your hive. Um, so who's who in the slide? So this is a little tricky, right? Here's Miss Queen. She's in the process of having her abdomen within a cell. So it makes it a little harder to kind of see her full body length. But that lovely bald thorax is the first thing that should be catching your eye, right? When you look at everybody else, look at how nice and hairy they are, right? So this is a very telltale sign with her. Here you have a drone. Look at his big eyes, right, that are covering the bulk of his head. There's another drone right here. Look at his big eyes. Look at the big body, too. I mean, he's, they're just stocky, stocky little guys when you compare it to his sister right here or another sister right here, right? There's quite a lot of drones in this image. There's another one here. There's another one here, um, another guy here. And so let's be even a little more realistic.
So of course here, center picture is your queen. You can tell she's nice and long in comparison to all the other individuals. What always catches my eye is that spot right there, right? That nice bald uh, thorax. Hopefully in all of your hives, that bald thorax will be covered with a dot of color. I'm a huge advocate for marking queens. I think that that's really an important part of beekeeping is to know who's the, who's the queen in your hive and to make sure you know how old she is and that you installed her in her history. But nonetheless, that's the first thing that catches my eye. Um, I know that there are a few drones in this image. Of course, my image is smaller than yours. Um, there's a drone right here. I can just tell by these gigantic eyes that are looking back at me. Um, but this should give you a little bit more of an appreciation of what you really would be seeing inside of your hive. And then I think we have one more before our break. Um, so this too might be what you're looking at when you're looking inside your hive. A little bit more challenging. And of course, the camera sure makes a lot of these look very, very shiny when they're actually very hairy. And so I have absolutely no clue where she is. <laughs> I, I can only see bees. Uh, this is too thick of an image, but I just wanted to give you an appreciation um, if you're not familiar with looking inside a hive as to what you might expect to see, that it's not as simplistic as when you, we look at each individual um, slide of images, um, but you know, we have to start easy and move to a harder section. So why don't we leave the slide up uh, let's take um, maybe like a five to eight minute break. We have a lot of information to still cover um, and we're just getting rolling, but let's at least, um, you know, do a, do a quick break. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to entertain those uh, if you like, or we can certainly cover them when we come back. Okay, Carolina, thank you very much. I do have one question here that you really didn't answer in the program. But do drones emit a pheromone that attract the queen? Is there anything? We'll talk about that. So we'll have a whole section where we'll really detail all the pheromones that are within the hive itself. So we'll talk about pheromones. Okay, perfect. So everyone, let's come back at um, 1035. That should give everybody a chance to either get more coffee or get rid of the coffee they just drank. And I'll see you back in. Surely. Okay. Thank you. I'll see you back too.
lock me out of the back.
Well, good morning, Carolina. I've got 1040 on my computer, so should we get started again? Okay, sounds like a plan. I am ready if you all are. Ready. All right, so. So I've got a bunch of questions in the chat box here for you. Okay, sure. Uh, let's see. So I got some questions on feeding, but I think that can wait. Um, as Dr. David Lewis is going to talk about that. How is research done to learn more about drone congregation areas? Um, I don't exactly know what the question is asked. I mean, we definitely... Um, uh, there are researchers that will um, identify, and a lot of times they'll fly balloons with virgin queen in cages attached to them to try to identify where in the landscape these drone congregation areas um, exist. And that's one way where we have appreciated um, being able to identify that these are repeatable year after year, which is pretty amazing because as I just told you, right, the drones are living through the winter into the next season. They're being produced seasonally. And yet they all know where the local hangouts are, so to speak. And so it's clear that there are some features in the environment that sort of beckon to be drone congregation areas as to what all those features are, I, I'm not clear on that, but I definitely know that research has identified that and it's through research that we've been able to figure out that these are repeatable year after year. Um, and so I think that just the fact that, you know, these drone bars, right? These drone congregation areas are identifiable to bees uh, in the landscape. I think that's pretty incredible. So how would you find a drone congregate beehives? And I've not really found it, but it just means that I haven't found it. Right. Well, as I said, I would probably um, read up on these techniques that have been used by researchers to identify those in your area as to, um, you know, uh, I, I'm sure it would be very curious to find that out, but from a beekeeping perspective, um, it, you know, it, it would just be a gee whiz, that's interesting side because there's nothing you will do to alter or manage that. Any other questions? Let's see. I mean, I think the only place where this comes into mind, right, having this awareness is if you are either trying to set up an isolated mating yard where you have more control over the queens that you are hoping to mate and trying to set up um, drone yards that need to be outside of your apiary, right, at other locations um, in order for these drones that you are raising to meet these queens that you are raising for whatever reason. I, I think that's when it might come into play. However, uh, I have read studies where they have been able to determine Queens having mated with specific drones, and don't ask me how they figured this out. I think it was via DNA analysis, um, where these matings have occurred not, like over nine miles from the queen's original location, right? And so um, it, there have been many studies that have looked at that. Some basically have said, I think over 50% of, like around 50% of matings happen within like two miles of home, right? And the rest of them, like, I think it was between five or six miles at home. There's other studies that have indicated that these distances are much wider, right? I suspect that probably the variability between studies 
has to do with where these people were located in the first place, right? That no two locations are gonna be the same in terms of you know, amounts or availability of drone congregation area, or even maybe amounts of, you know, like the proportion of drones in the environment versus the need of the bee. But given that some of these studies have shown that they might travel over nine miles to mate, I mean, that should give us all an appreciation that if you're trying to um, isolate or manipulate mating, um, that you're really discussing vast, potentially vast distances where this can occur and how difficult that really would be to fully manipulate. Okay, well, thanks. That's, it's, it seems complicated and it seems like <laughs> you're flying nine miles away, her risk of being consumed by a bird is huge. Yes, exactly. And yeah. so, you know, and that speaks to the fact that, as I said, always think about what bees do as practical, right? So if they are needing to replace a queen, you know, that they don't just raise one, that they raise multiples, right? For exactly that reason, right? That the one that might have, you know, emerged first and gone out to mate, you know, might decide she's going to go nine miles from home and be eaten by a bird along the way. And so, of course, they need to have reserves in the back. Um, now, of course, I mentioned, right, that when a queen emerges, one of the things that she will do as she's, you know, um, getting to know her new home is walk around and take care of any competitors that might have either co-emerged at the same time that she did or might still be in the cocoon um, waiting to be, in, you know, waiting to come out, right? That she will sting the side of those cells to get rid of her competitor. And so, however, right, the intrigue goes further, which is the, if she did that, right, if she was able to eliminate all of her competitors, then if she were to fly out to mate and the bird eats her, right, the bees would be SOL. And they know that. And so being practical girls, right, they will manipulate the situation and they shield some of these queen cells um, to be prevented from being killed off by this queen early on, just in case she gets eaten by a bird, that they have a backup plan, right? I also read a study a number of years ago that they said, well, not all queens are the same. And uh, what the study looked at is that they were able to determine that, all right, so the queens being formed, right, might be full sisters to a worker in the hive or half sisters to a worker in the hive, right? And that workers are able to determine as a queen is developing how related she is to them and that they have a preference for queens that are their full sister versus their half sister. And what they will sometimes do is as the queen is emerging from the cell and that little, you know, uh, you know, operculum uh, opening, right? That little hatch that is open for the on the queen cell for the queen to emerge is cut. That workers will hang out in those openings and hold the flap shut. And in doing so, they're preventing her from emerging, perhaps giving another queen that is more similar genetic to her the advantage of emerging slightly earlier and catching that one, the competitor, still trapped within the cell. And so, um, you know, so there's all this, I always say that there's a lot of court intrigue, right? You have a whole bunch of women in a hive, it's never gonna be that simple, right? They're gonna be very practical, but at the same time, there's gonna be all this subtext that is going on. And I think that that's one of the fascinations of beekeeping is that everything that I'm covering, you know, I'm sort of hitting the surface of all of these stories, but within all of these stories, I'm leaving a lot of the conversation out simply because we don't have the time to cover it. Um, and also too, it makes things really complicated. Um, but, you know, as I said, with all of this, there's all of these intricacies and subtexts 
And that's part of what makes beekeeping fascinating is that you're always learning new things. And of course, researchers are always learning new things and sharing it with us. And we start getting this appreciation of all of these details within the hive that we never knew existed, or sometimes too as a beekeeper, if you're really attentive and you observe your hive and you spend time in there, there are things you observe that you don't read about um, that are just really fascinating in terms of what, you know, what all is going on in this society um, that we just haven't yet completely elucidated. Uh, are there any other questions that have come up, Catherine, before I move on? I, there was a lot of answered most of it. Okay. So uh, let's, let's proceed on. All right, let's move on. So one of the challenges, of course, is as we're covering these topics is that they're all interrelated. Um, and so it's sort of the chicken and the egg. Where do I start by telling you all these things about bee biology and development? So let's look at, let's review some things and let's add some things to what we already covered to really try to fill in the picture a little bit more. So um, I had mentioned to you that, um, Females, both queens and workers, are developed from fertilized eggs, and that drones are developed from unfertilized eggs, and that they go through these stages of development. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. So let's start at the beginning, right? Let's start at the egg, since we've already talked about the chicken, so to speak, and let's kind of try to tie things together. So Honeybees, given that they fall within this group of insects, go through stages of development like many insects do. And there are really four main stages that uh, we have to consider. The first one is an egg, right? So all bees first come from an egg. The queen, of course, as I mentioned to you, is the main reproductive um, individual within the colony that lays the egg. She has a very long abdomen. She's going to be laying these eggs within the wax comb. So here is a picture of what that would look like. And what I want you to pay attention to is that these eggs are just not randomly laid, right? When you look at a section of comb and you're looking for the egg stage, you're going to find the egg dead center at the bottom of the cell, ideally. That is where its normal positioning is. She has a long abdomen. That long abdomen will go all the way down to the bottom of the cell. She will deposit the egg. When it's first deposited, the egg is gonna stand upright. It is slightly glued to the bottom of that cell while it's standing upright. And that is a feature of a normal laying queen. One egg in each cell, dead center bottom. That is what you're expecting to see. They will stay in the egg um, stage for about three days time period. After about three days, that egg will no longer be upright. It will be on the side. And then of course, from the egg, you will get the next stage of development, which is a larva. Now, Keep in mind that at this point in time, that egg has already been decided whether it's male or female simply because of whether or not it's fertilized. And to take it a step further, one of the processes that the queen takes into account to make a decision as to whether to lay a drone or a worker uh, or a fertilized egg, because she won't know that it's a worker, she doesn't get to decide that part, is by making sure that the uh, comb in which she lays it is appropriate for that um, sex and also too that the time of year is appropriate, right? So let's say that it's springtime, it's time to also start including some drones. 
as the queen is moving around the comb, she's gonna be evaluating that cell in which she's gonna lay the egg. She's gonna smell for that squeaky clean smell that I told you that workers will leave behind when the cell is properly clean and ready to accept an egg. So she's gonna look for that. And then the other thing that she's gonna do is she's gonna take her front legs, the queen will, she's gonna measure the size of that comb, right? And if it's appropriately sized, for a worker egg, then she will make sure that when she lays that egg that it's fertilized to be developed into a female. However, if it's the time of year where it's appropriate to lay um, eggs for drone development, she likewise, she's gonna measure that cell and it needs to be of a slightly larger size to accommodate for a drone. And so that's another way that the queen makes a decision as to what type of uh, individual she's laying an egg for is to make sure that that comb is the right sizing to accept the individual. Drones have that bigger body as we talked about. So during their development, they need a little bit more room in order to properly develop as uh, into a drone. So she will make that determination. So now that the egg is laid, the egg will hatch into a larva. And you can see that picture here, right? A nice little white worm just like all larvae are looking uh, as. Um, I mentioned to you that bees, um, that we always think of Italian bees as maybe being a little blonder, right? Carniolans being a little darker. And so you do have variability in the coloring of the final adult bee from a, from a very blonde golden color to some very dark mahogany colored bees. However, in these developmental stages, they're all the same. So all healthy, normal larvae will be nice, crispy, plump, white. And that's what you're expecting to see. Um, and so they will be in this larval stage. They're laying on one side, nicely curled, right? As they get older, larvae will be larger in size than smaller larvae. And at this point in time too, you can see that these larvae are being fed, right? Eggs don't need food, but once they are in the larval stage, they need to be fed. So the nurse bees, right? Those younger bees with those healthy hypopharyngeal glands, will walk around and they will start depositing food that is being produced by those hypopharyngeal glands, royal jelly and um, some, um, uh, you know, um, honey, nectar um, into these developing larvae. And of course, as the larvae grow in size, they go through molting periods. So we often talk about the five molting stages that these larvae will go uh, through. Um, from that larval stage, once they have gone through their appropriate molt, they will then start um, going into the pupal stage and they will pupate within a cocoon. So a cocoon is spun within those uh, cells. And of course, it will also include a spinning of that cocoon to cover the top of the cells themselves. Um, and so we go from egg to larvae to pupae. They'll go through metamorphosis, just as some other insects will do as well where they start developing their adult body shape, right? You can see some here in the purple eye stage where we can start seeing some wing development, right? They're already developing into the three segments of the body. Um, and then of course, from the pupil stage, once they're done going through metamorphosis, they're going to uh, emerge as a fully formed adult, right? Being a queen, a worker, or a drone. One of the things that is different as you're going through these stages is also dependent as to whether you're a worker, a queen, or a drone. So they all stay in the egg stage for about three days. However, once you get into the larval stage, that time period of how long you're in that larval stage really varies depending on what cast you know, what cast member you are within the hive itself. A queen will stay in that larval stage about 
you know, 4.6 days, and I know that sounds sort of silly to have the 4.6, but there's some genetic variability uh, that has a factor here into how long you are in that larval stage. Workers about six days, drones about seven days. Same thing, once they're in that pupil stage, the amount of time that they take to go through the stage is going to be varied as to what individual we're talking about. So queens will be about seven and a half days. Uh, workers are about 12 days and drones about 14 and a half days in that time period. And so in the end, to go through these four stages, right, will vary from individual to individual. A queen will take around 16 days, it may be as early as 14 days for some strains, right? But on average, about 16 days. Workers, about 12 days. And drones, about 24 days to complete these four stages from beginning to end. Um, and so this has important implications for a beekeeper because of course, if you're raising queens, uh, you need to know these developmental time periods to make appropriate management decisions. From a disease perspective too, uh, for example, varroa mites are very much attracted to developing alongside with drones because these extra couple of days in development gives the varroa mite a reproductive advantage in order to make potentially one more varroa uh, to infect bees in that time period. And so, so these are important um, facts to know uh, as a beekeeper because it has implications in terms of our management um, of bees. This is just a close up for those of us that need cheaters, right? To help us be able to get a closer look as to what things look like. So here I want you to appreciate that all of these eggs are freshly laid. They're standing upright. They're at the bottom dead center of the cell themselves. Queens are the only ones that are able to do that, to lay a dead center um, and one egg at a time. That's what you normally expect to see. Here you can see these beautiful developing larvae. They're nice and white, nice and plump. They're floating amidst this very rich nutrition um, in order to be able to develop. And of course, if you were to look at these even more closely, right, uh, larvae, just like adult bees have spiracles, which are those openings that allow them to breathe, right? And they would be on this upper side of the larvae itself so that they're able to breathe through those spiracles, even though they're the rest of their body is laying amidst this plethora of food it itself. And then here's a closer up of them um, going through the pupil stage. If you were to look at the slide closely, um, sadly, the coloring is not that distinct, right? But originally you would see the bees wax making up the comb down here. And then you would have subsequent layering of cocoons. Um, as each generation is reusing these cells, right? So these cocoons are laid on the interior of the cell as well as on the outside of the cell itself uh, in order to make the cocoon. And even though um, the bees will go ahead and clean these cells to be repeatedly used, you know, some of this layering of cocoons remains. And that too has implications as a beekeeper because as we reuse or allow the reuse of these combs within hives, right? One of the things that you are um, contributing to is the narrowing and the reducing of size of these cells as these layers of cocoons accumulate. Of course, over time too, by reusing these combs, Right, not only are these cells becoming smaller because of the layering of cocoons, but they're also absorbing more and more um, chemicals, right? Both environmental and those that are used within the beehive by beekeepers. Um, and so we no longer recommend using combs at infinitum within hives. Um, we won't talk about comb rotation, but that's one of the reasons too why we rotate comb is not just because of the toxicity that builds up by external and internal chemicals within the hive, but also too because these 
um, the, the size of the comb openings over time get reduced just by the accumulation of the cocoons um, as they're being used within the hive. So one of the things that I had just mentioned to you is that of course, the, the queen is going to use all of these environmental signals to let her know when it is time to raise drones, right? Part of it is dependent on the availability of food outside in the environment. Part of it, of course, is dependent on genetics. Part of it will be dependent on, you know, the time, the time of the year that it is, right? That cue all on its own um, in determining whether it's time to start raising drones. And then I, and as I mentioned to you, because the drones are kind of huskier boys and they require a little bit more room for development, as she's walking around the comb, she will measure the cell size with her front legs, right? To make her make adjustments as to whether or not it's appropriate to lay an unfertilized egg for a drone or a fertilized egg for a worker. Well, for us beekeepers, another note to help us differentiate where there are workers developing and where there are drone brood developing within the hive, because as a larvae and an egg, they all look the same, right? But once they enter the pupil stage and they form a cocoon, workers have a very flat top to their cocoons. And so I think of them as just slight little pillows, right? They're not perfectly flat. They are a little, um, um, you know, a little um, plushed out. Um, however, drones, not only do they get a wider cell size, but they also need a little bit more headroom as well for their development. And so when you look at their cocoons, they're much larger, they're bullet shaped. They almost, they do look like the top of a bullet. And so when you're looking at a section of brood, you can very easily tell where you see a worker being developed and where you're seeing a drone being developed just by the shape of that um, uh, cocoon itself. So here you'll see nice fl flatter ones, which are all workers, and the ones here that are more bullet shape, right, let you know that drones are being developed within those. Now, what about queens? So queens too, they need more room. They need more room for development. And so part of it is also dependent on what are the conditions under which the queens are being created. And I won't discuss that. That's a topic all of its own, right? However, um, I do want you to be able to identify if there is a queen cell being developed within the hive because it's pretty easy to see them. And so within the hive, if you're just normally going through the comb, you will occasionally see these structures within the hive itself. These structures are just called queen cups. They may not be used, right? They may just sit empty, just like you might have sections of comb that are not being used and are just sitting empty, right? Waiting for their purpose to be used. So it is not unusual as you're going through the hive in various locations along the comb to see these queen cups. If you look inside of them, they're nice and empty. They're just a structure they are waiting to be used. If, however, they are raising queens, either to replace one that has been killed, to replace one that is not performing appropriately, to make queens because they're planning on swarming and so they need to leave queens either behind or they need a queen for the swarm, whatever the reason is, as I said, there's multiples of them. The queen, because she has that larger body and she needs to develop appropriately, she too will have a chamber that is appropriate for her, for her size. And so when you see these structures within the hive, either fully developed, capped, closed as this cocoon is, right? Or one that is in the process of going there, these are known as queen cells. So these are structures in which a larvae is now a pupa pupating into an adult queen. To me, they look like peanuts and they're about the size of a peanut. They're very uh, distinguishable. So here you can see comb um, 
that contains worker brood that is within their own cocoons, right? Nice and flat. I don't see anybody here that is uh, a drone. And here is a lovely queen that is being uh, raised. So let's look at this more closely as to what you might find in a, in a hive, right? So here you see worker larvae, worker pupa, sorry, being developed. Here you can see some drones, right? Nice bullet shapes within this section of comb. You see some drones over here as well. Right, there's one there, one there. And then now of course, you'll see some queen cells being developed. You have one here, you have one here. Uh, and so they're, they're very easy to distinguish. Let's look at another now without any bees on there, right? So here are some worker pupa, all nice and flat. You know, when you look at them, they look, to me, they always look like fabric. They have these beautiful weavings at the top, you know, of their cocoons. Um, if you compare that to the wax that is covering the honey here on the outer combs, right? The texture is quite different. Um, so it's very easy to distinguish where there is wax that is capping honey below and where you are seeing your um, pupil stages. So these are all workers. Here, of course, you see some drones. Here you see a plethora of drones. And then of course, here you see a plethora of drones as well. So it's very easy to distinguish one from the other. This is just to remind you, right, that when we talked about those developmental stages of uh, honeybees from egg to fully formed adult, right, as they go from egg to larva to pupa to fully formed adult, that the time period of development between those stages varies from depending on who you are within the hive. So the queen is the one that develops the fastest. Of course, that makes perfect sense, right? Keep in mind, uh, bees are practical, so is mother nature. So if you have a hive that is dependent on the queen for its survival, right? The queen being the important reproductive member of the hive, if she is missing, right? The dumb beekeeper accidentally squished her uh, and the hive needs to replace her, we need to replace her chop chop, right? So she's gonna be the one that develops the fastest, right? She's gonna take 16 days 14 to 16 days is really on average what we fall in. Um, the workers, right, are next in line. They're gonna take about 21 days on average. I said there's a little variability uh, in those days, but on average, 21 days. And of course the drones, our little boys just take a little longer to get their bodies together. And so we look at around about 24 days for them. Um, and so this is something that is really important if you're a beginning beekeeper to, to learn and commit to memory. Because as I said, it has a lot of implications in terms of management uh, within the hive itself. So let's talk a little bit more about these pheromones, right? I kept throwing them out that, you know, there are these pheromones within the hive and they have all of these implications, but let's look at that a little bit more in depth, right? What are these pheromones? What do they do? Who has them? Who doesn't, et cetera. Um, so pheromones are chemical signals. They're used to communicate within the hive. Imagine that you're living in a hive environment that is dark, right? There's no light within the hive it itself, maybe some coming from the entry, but you're really operating in the darkness. Uh, you know, you have 60,000 of your closest family members working with you, um, and they all have all these various tasks going on within the hive. Um, you know, be very difficult to communicate via other ways, where a chemical signal is pretty easy to either sense within the hive right, or pass from one individual to the other individual, and that way kind of spread it throughout the hive so everybody sort of knows what's going on. And so it's a really effective way to communicate. Um, and so that is the purpose of these pheromones. Uh, I mentioned to you, right, that trophallaxis, that's the um, way of 
spreading from one proboscis to the next, right? That's just the term used for that way of communicating, right? So bees might transfer to one another nectar um, via trophallaxis, but they can also um, spread pheromones in the, via uh, direct contact, right? They can also spread pheromones by the antenna touching a pheromone or the receptors within their feet touching a pheromone and passing it to one another. So there's many ways of spreading a pheromone uh, throughout the colony. There are also pheromones that we'll talk about that become aerials, you know, spread via aerosol where it's um, released into the air and then by fanning the wings of the bees, they create an air current that spreads that pheromone aerially uh, to alert other members. Um, and so there's many different ways of spreading this chemical signal, but it's a way for them to communicate. And so pheromones are key within the hive. Um, everybody makes them in some way or another. So the queen will make a variety of pheromones. There's a number of pheromones that she produces. Um, I mentioned to you that I always think of the queen as having two main functions. One, of course, is reproduction, right? She needs to lay the eggs. She needs to be an egg machine for that hive uh, to have the number of individuals that it needs in order to effectively act, you know, act as a unit, right? You need workers to feed babies. You need workers to bring food into the hive. You need workers to maintain the hive environment, right? So that's one huge responsibility that she has. The other responsibility that she has that kind of goes along with that, right, is the production of these substances, these queen substances, um, because those pheromones that she releases has a huge impact as to what happens um, around her, about her, uh, about the hive itself. Uh, these pheromones are um, oftentimes spread via contact. So it's not uncommon for the queen to be surrounded by workers, right? Her little retinue of workers, and they are in direct contact with her. So they will feed her, they will groom her, right? They're her attendants, they take care of her, but they're like the... Um, you know, like the, the covert CIA in that they're taking care of her. And so she might think of them as friends, but at the same time, they're also constantly monitoring her with their antenna and their, you know, sensors on their feet to see how much pheromone she's exuding, right? That gives them an idea of how she's performing in her task as a reproductive individual. So young queens that are well-mated exude a great amount of pheromone and that those pheromones will diminish with age and they will diminish as her uh, reproduction potential decreases. And so it's a really great way for these bees, right? These covert bees to keep an eye on how well she's doing is by monitoring her, her pheromone level. This pheromone level, of course, too, in the young virgin queens acts as a sex attractant as they are flying through the drone congregation area. So not only do their eyes of the drone serve to scan the sky to see the virgin queen flying by, but of course, she's also exuding her pheromone to act as an attractant so they, they can smell her and they can follow her trail to try to catch her. Um, the amount of pheromone she exudes also stimulates brood rearing, right? So the more virile she is as a young queen, you know, the more that really motivates everybody in the hive, you know, to be ready, to be pumped, to be primed for, for rearing brood. Of course, it's going to stimulate foragers to go out and work, right? This way they know what they're working for because of the fact that she's exuding all of this reproductive potential. Um, I had mentioned to you that she's not the only one that's a girl, right? She is the fully functional female of the hive because the food she was given while she was a larva um, forced these changes within the body of that larva to develop into a full female. 
but her sisters, right, that are workers or half sisters are also female and they are partially able to have reproductive potential. So these workers are able to lay eggs under the wrong circumstances. And in part is the presence of this queen pheromone within the hive itself that suppresses the workers' um, ability or desire, right, to lay eggs. Um, the moment that that um, inhibitor, right, is removed, if you are to remove the queen and her substance from the hive for a longer period of time, you know, that the, the lack of that substance being present is what then triggers these workers to lay eggs. And so, so one of the um, um, importance of the existence of this queen, of the queen's pheromones, right, is to suppress um, the ability of other members of the hive to, to lay eggs, right? So it, it inhibits the full development of this, this ability in workers. Now workers too have their own pheromones, right? Uh, the two that I think of mostly with workers, they're not the only ones, but they're the two that I think mostly. One is the Nazanoff gland, right? That produces an attractant. And where that gland is um, exists within the bee herself is in this last upper segment of her abdomen. And you can see it right there. And it's oftentimes used as sort of, I think of it as like the come hither smell, right? If you have a need for bees to call upon one another. So for example, um, let's say that you have um, um, a beekeeper that accidentally shakes off bees from a frame right next to the hive, right? And you're creating all of this commotion of loose bees outside of their normal um, hive. What they will do is as soon as they fly towards their hive opening, they will then settle down, expose this Nazanoff gland, right? Beat their wings so that they volatilize this scent into the air to let other bees know here is where we are, here is where you must go. You also see it a lot in swarms, right? To try to keep both cohesiveness in swarms or as swarms, if you hive a swarm right into a new hive, what they will do is that they will um, indicate to the other bees that might still be flying about or have gotten separated from the main swarm, here we are, this is where you need to go is by releasing this pheromone um, into the air. It's also used as an attractant uh, to signal water sources, sometimes too to signal food sources. So it really is sort of the come hither um, attractant. Um, I also mentioned to you that when honeybees sting and they leave the stinger behind, right, that you also have a pheromone that is released to mark that one that was marked with the stinger, right? To make it easier for other bees to know who the target is because they have released that pheromone. And then of course too, they, one of the pheromones that uh, workers release that we become very familiar with as beekeepers is that they also have a alarm pheromone. And they might, they might release that on certain days when you are investigating the hive. So if you were to remove the lid on the outside of your hive, you sometimes will see bees that will um, come in from that inner cover and be on the outer aspect of the hive itself. And they start releasing an alarm pheromone that smells kind of like overripe bananas. And that's a really good way for the bees to alert everybody within the hive, danger, danger may be at hand. Um, and so that's one that we can certainly smell as beekeepers and are related to. Uh, brood also releases its own pheromones. And so um, the brood itself 
releases pheromones that help the nurse bees recognize the gender of the brood, the age of the brood. And so, and, and by factoring these things in, it of course helps those um, worker bees be able to properly uh, feed and, and serve the, the nutritional needs of the larvae. Um, the larvae are not fed exactly the same proportion of ingredients, so to speak, in their food throughout their development. And I mentioned to you that what worker um, larvae are fed is a slightly different composition that what bees would feed a larvae that they are destined to rear into a queen. That is that difference in the nutritional value of the food that's being fed to the larvae that induces the development of the reproductive structures within the queen itself. Well, um, the bees get some help in trying to um, determine what is being fed right, by the pheromone that the brood is exuding to let them know what gender, what age they are, what their feeding needs are. This also has implications from other perspective. So I mentioned to you that uh, Moroa mites have a predilection for drone brood because the developmental time of the drone is longer than that of a worker. And so one way that the Moroa mite is able to discern uh, and be attracted to the drone brood is because the pheromones that they exude are different. So they smell differently acting as an attractant. Um, so now that you have brood within a hive and are exuding the pheromone, the level of these pheromones present also contributes to increasing the foraging of pollen within the hive. So I mentioned to you the queen substance contributes to that, right? If she has really strong substances of her pheromones present in the hive, that that really stimulates foraging. Well, now if you mix that with high levels of brood pheromone within the hive, that too um, supports that high uh, foraging behavior um, by bees. And so these brood pheromones contribute to that. And then this brood pheromone along with the queen pheromone also inhibits the development of the worker ovaries and their ability to lay eggs, right? So you'll have multiple factors present within the hive that regulate um, similar or the same behavior that's going on in the hive. Um, and that's one of the sort of the complications of pheromones is that you have multiple signals within the hive that trigger various um, behaviors that are occurring. So of course, drones also have their own pheromone, right? Everybody is exuding these chemical signals to help regulate these activities within the hive. Um, we theorize that of course, the drone pheromone aids in attracting other drones to the drone congregation area, right? So clearly there are some environmental features that we discussed that act as an attractant for drones, but then the presence of other drones, right? So uh, who wants to be the only one at a party, right? The boys wanna hang out together. So as you're having more of these drone pheromones, right? It's attracting other drones to that area. Um, I mentioned to you too that, um, you know, the drone factor, right, is an attractant to the Varroa mite. So that's something too to keep in mind that um, these drone pheromones, all these pheromones are, are acting in other ways as well. The hive itself produces an odor, and I think of that as a pheromone. Um, so each hive has a distinct odor. You will appreciate that as a beekeeper. Um, I always tell beginning beekeepers or any beekeeper, but particularly beginning beekeepers, that when you approach your hive, right, observe the behavior that's going on on the outside of the hive, right? How many bees are coming and going? What does the trash look like in the front of the hive? You know, take all of that into account before you even pop the lid. But once you take that outer cover out, right, take a moment to smell your hive, right? That tells you a lot of what may be going on in that hive 
Um, you know, you might be able to appreciate the nectar source has switched because the smell of your hive is different, right? The floral sources have changed. If there's disease present in the hive, right, it's going to change the odor of the hive itself. Um, and so, but every hive has a slightly different scent that even we can appreciate. So I can only think of what the bees are perceiving themselves. Um, this hive odor, pheromone, right, um, scents every individual within that hive itself. And so as the bees are coming and going, the guard bees, right, are registering if that incoming bee has the odor, right? Does she smell like home smells? Does she smell like everybody should smell? And that's one of the ways that they um, can differentiate who belongs and who does not belong. This hive odor is just a combination of all substances, right? So it's made up of the, key, uh, the, the queen substances. It's made up of all these other smells that are occurring within the hive in terms of food, storage, brood, proportion of individuals within the hive itself. Um, the, um, the um, it, it, you know, there's probably importance to this odor as well for bees that are returning home, right? So they have this lovely built-in GPS system that allows them to really peg the location of home based on the location of the, uh, the sun in the sky when they're leaving um, you know, their hive, but also too, as they're returning to the hive, right? They're also homing in, uh, being able to differentiate a little bit their home to the other home, especially since we have a propensity of putting so many hives together in an apiary that mother nature wouldn't do on her own, right? You don't usually have hives one next to the other uh, in one given location. Now there's also uh, trail pheromones, just like other insects have sort of footprints that leave a uh, scent behind. Bees certainly have that as well. They'll leave it behind as they walk. It seems like all cast members have sort of this trail pheromone present. And um, you sometimes will see it too if you're hiding a swarm, especially on a ground location. Uh, it's amazing to see bees march in rows one behind the other as they're entering the new uh, hive itself. And of course, part of it is the Nazanoff pheromone that is being exuded into the air by the bees. But the other factor is also if the bees are walking into a certain path, right, that they are following that trail pheromone uh, as they are moving. Um, so we've talked a little bit about communication, right, via pheromones. Another important aspect of bees that they need to communicate, of course, has to do with foraging itself. Um, and, you know, that's such a huge importance in terms of uh, survival within the hive, but of course, huge importance for us as humans, right? One of the reasons we keep bees is because of their incredible foraging capabilities. And so I'll remind you that I told you that bees can perceive wavelengths of light in different spectrums that we can. They can see a lot more into the ultraviolet aspect. And so together with obviously differences in the anatomy of their eyes, they do see the world differently. And so um, this is another example of what a honeybee might see, right, if we were able to see in the wavelengths that she does, is if you're looking at a dandelion to us, it's just some yellow flower, right, from one edge to the other. But no, there are all these hidden signals within flowers, the coloring of flowers that bees can perceive that we can't. And so here, very distinctly, right, the coloring is indicating the bullseye of where she's going to find her, her um, nectar resource, and of course, the hidden pollen, right, that the flower hopes the bee is going to pick up in order to assist in pollinating one flower to the other. Um, foraging in bees really happens during ideal temperatures, right? So we normally think of, you know, mid-60s 
to, of course, mid 80s would be the most ideal temperature. They will forage at hotter temperatures in our area. Um, bees will travel on average up to three miles from home. They certainly can go five to eight miles from home. There's nothing that prevents them from traveling that far. The challenge, of course, is that what you're looking at is what the energy expenditure is of traveling that greater distance for what you can forage and bring back home. And so we tend to think of the ideal distance of foraging to be up to three miles. When you start going beyond that, there seems to be uh, less of a chance that uh, the calorie expenditure is worth the distance from home. Um, they will look for what's best. So not necessarily what's closest, but what is best. And so I told you that it's amazing that when bees are at a flower source, by tasting that nectar, they are able to evaluate what the food value is of that nectar. And so part of it, I'm sure, is that the uh, proportion and the content of sugar that that nectar has. So for example, if you have an orchard of pears and they're heavily bloomed under, uh, let's say, by a combination of dandelions and alfalfa, well, the bees will know that the dandelion and the alfalfa is a more sugar-rich nectar than pear nectar is. And so they'll have a preference for other flowers. And so they're able to distinguish um, what is in their best interest to forage. And of course, one of the things that makes them excellent pollinators is that they practice what we call floral fidelity. And what that is, is if they are in, let's say, um, we won't pick a pear orchard since pear nectar is a little lower in sugar. Let's say that we'll pick, um, you know, we'll, we'll say apples, right? Apples, and we'll have a standard orchard that horribly mows their lawn underneath and there's nothing else to be found. Um, or maybe just a few other flowers here and there. What flora fidelity is, is once a bee has honed in as to what her nectar source is, she will have a preference to complete visiting more flowers of the same type, right? So she'll go from apple flower to apple flower to apple flower before returning home. And obviously that is a benefit to both, to, to the, to the uh, flower that she's visiting because now you have apple pollen going from apple blossom to apple blossom to apple blossom, really making the bee an ideal pollinator. And that's because she likes to practice floral fidelity. She's not going to go to the apple blossom and then down to the dandelion and then down to the whatever, and then back up to the flower, to the um, apple flower. She will really be, um, visiting one flower species at a time. Um, in doing so, right, it's pretty amazing that she will even, um, and not only will she travel generally three miles or so from home to try to find a really good uh, food source, but in doing so, right, she might fly 12 to 14 miles per hour. I mean, I think that that is crazy to think of a bee flying that fast. It's really amazing. And when she's fully packed, right, both with nectar and or if she's fully packed with pollen, she might carry a fifth or a third of her body weight as she is flying back home. I mean, that is phenomenal. Imagine, imagine, you know, uh, being a tiny little bee traveling three miles and then carrying a third of your body weight as you're coming back home. I think that's, that's pretty insane. Um, I also think about the fact um, that one honeybee might make a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in her life. And so my family always makes fun of me that when we empty a jar of honey uh, in our house, that I will make my last cup of tea inside of that jar, right, to use every minuscule little drop of honey. And um, they laugh at me. They look in the jar and they say, it's empty. Like you can't scrape it with a spoon any more than we have scraped it. 
and I look in there and I'm like, at least three bees gave up their lives for the amount of honey that's still in there, right? You cannot let that go to waste, right? Those poor little bees work really hard for that. And so, so keep that in mind, right? Even though they are just such amazing creatures in their foraging, uh, really the amount that a single bee produces, right, is, is technically minuscule. And so when, we're hot, when we are collecting, um, you know, 45 to 300 pounds of honey off of an individual hive, right? The amount of labor that it went into that, I think is really pretty uh, phenomenal. Um, and so, and then one last thing to mention about foraging is that robbing, of course, the robbing of hives by other honeybees is also considered a form of foraging. So if you are at a time period where um, one hive is declining, right, be it disease or some other reason, um, you know, a queen failed and she was never appropriately replaced and that hive is ripe to be robbed by other honeybees, right, that they are engaging in another form of foraging, right, robbing is foraging as well. Um, and so we'll conclude today, we'll just have a few more slides, right, that further discusses um, the foraging behavior of bees. And that is, how do bees communicate this information, right? We just talked about how amazing they are at foraging. Uh, however, they need to do this foraging on a communal basis to really be most effective. And the main way that bees communicate where to forage is really communicating with dancing. Um, and so in their bee dance, right, they're communicating the distance, they're communicating the direction of where that food resource is, and they're also sharing via trophallaxis, right, that food resource. And those are the three things that they're passing to one another in order to communicate. Um, I have participated in um, groups and I always think that this would be so much fun to do again one day where um, you, as a group of beekeepers sit together with a map and are given information of the bee dancing. Um, and then based on her dance, right, you, you decipher based on your map what information she is communicating as to where the food resource is. And so, so there's two types of dances she could possibly do. One is called the round dance and one is called the wagtail dance. Um, the round dance is used to indicate food that is fairly close to the hive. Right, it's usually within 80 to 100 yards from the hive. It's not a very complicated dance, right? She's sort of going in the round. Um, and while she's doing that, she's sharing that nectar that she collected, right? To let them know what is the taste, what is the smell that they are after. The, the dance is fairly um, simple because she's not having to communicate really difficult information. That food resource is very close within the hive. Um, the dance that is certainly a lot more magnificent um, is the wagtail dance. That one is really used to give information of any food resource that really is far from the hive itself. It's going to be very specific in terms of the direction of what the bee should be flying to. It will give specific information as to the distance that this food is uh, from the hive itself. Of course, in the process too, she will likewise share that food resource with her um, nest mates, right? To let them know what the scent and what the taste of that food resource is. And the wagtail dance is oftentimes also known as the figure eight dance. And so what she'll do is that she'll travel in a figure eight as she is dancing. In the middle of the figure eight, she does a lovely little waggle, right? As she is traveling through. And 
um, the waggle is not only sensed by the bees that are surrounding her and in close contact with her, but the vibration of that waggle is also transmitted via the webbing of the top of the bee comb, right? So even bees that are slightly away from her can feel the vibrations of her waggle and be able to understand the information that she is transmitting without being directly next to her. Now, what is important in the waggle dance is not just the waggle and the sharing of the food, but also to the position that this figure eight takes within the hive itself. Because this center portion where she's doing the waggle, the direction of that designates based on the position of the sun in the sky and the angle at which this figure eight is being occurring, that's occurring on the comb, the angle from the sun that the sort of the direction of where the food is located. So it's pretty amazing that they're able to transmit this information between one another. And so rather than talk about it, um, let me show you a short video of that. So we'll stop that video because of course, then she gets off of the screen itself, right? But you can appreciate that bees are monitoring her as she's walking through her figure eight waggle and paying attention to both the direction in which this waggle is occurring, right? The number of waggles that she is doing as well. Um, but the other aspect of that is the fact that the comb itself is also transmitting those vibrations to bees that are in the immediate area, but not um, right next to her. And uh, I wish we could spend all afternoon talking about all the nuances and the details of this, because it's certainly um, a lot of fun to sit down and watch a bee communicate and then sit down with a map and a compass and, uh, and a ruler to gauge distance, right? And be able to map out where she is coming from um, and be able to decipher, um, you know, what information she is transmitting. Hey, Carolina. Yes, ma'am. We just, we just watched a, a baby bee emerge from a cell. Which yes, is I, kind of I cool. almost wish that they didn't have that on there just because we're looking at conflicting information. But do you want to go back to that? Yeah, let's let's watch because okay. the little thing came up oh, since sorry. baby. Hold on. Like, Hold again. One second. Okay. Where you stand?
we'll go to the slow mo side, then it's easier to see because in this speed, yeah. she was uh, almost instantaneously out. What cracks me up are all the tongues hanging out here on the glass as the bees are facing us. <laughs> And so you'll see her right here, of course, that cocoon has been pierced and removed enough to give her space to start crawling out of the cell itself. Let's see if we see more than just that. And I think that's all we get to see, Catherine, of, of her emergence. Well, the, the waggle dance is really fascinating to watch, especially the way she vibrates and all the attention she's getting. And the poor baby bee is getting stepped on and ignored. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So we're down to our last few minutes. And so I left that open for, for any questions. I, I appreciate everybody's attention to sit through something for a few hours is, um, takes a lot of focus. And as I said, I, I hope it's, it's sort of been a little eye opening as to all the things that are happening. Um, with bees inside the hive and their biology. But um, I apologize over the fact that there are so many topics that we can only really cover the, the bare basics on. Um, but if there's any, any questions, I'd be happy to elaborate on, on anything in particular. Okay. Um, is, so is there a scent, commercial pheromone or scent that can block swarming? So is there a firm one or something that can block swarming? No, um, there's nothing that will block swarming except appropriate management. And even that, it's not 100%, right? So that's one of the skill sets of a beekeeper is to um, appropriately address hives um, as we're entering swarming season to try to address the need that is being expressed by the bees. However, they do make synthetic pheromones that act as attractants, so swarm lures, right, um, that you can use to um, position uh, on the outskirts of your apiary to hopefully attract any swarm that is being emitted into an awaiting container, so to speak. Um, and so, so those are definitely manufactured. Um, is the swarm lures, but no, nothing to prevent swarming. Uh, swarming is a, um, is a high drive, right? It's mother nature's way of making two hives out of one. And of course, mother nature is always looking to reproduce. So that's a huge drive uh, for hives and certainly something that should be in some ways welcome because that means that hive made it through the winter, that it's strong, and so it's strong and it wants to be divided. And so it's for us beekeepers to take appropriate management steps to um, divide those hives, to relieve the pressure that they are feeling. And in the process of doing so, we get two for one. Okay, so another question from Anne. It says, very early this spring, early March, I saw drones in one of my hives. Is it possible they overwintered? Mm, maybe. I mean, it's a rare thing, right? It may be that it depends when. Um, for example, uh, in my area, I already had fresh pollen coming in for, from silver maples about two weeks ago. And so usually that starts stimulating the desire to make drones. I wasn't expecting. Now maybe there'll be some um, being you know, at this point in my hive. Uh, so her sound a little early, but that depends on hive conditions and environmental conditions. But 
you know, there may be the spare guy that didn't get frozen, but usually we don't think of drones through the winter. Oh. And from Michael, I have crushed corn out right now, feeding his birds. And, and the bees, bees are going are... for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's very common. It's not, um, a lot of times during this time of year, they will pick up, um, you know, food dust particles, right? You get a lot of chicken, you know, people who own backyard chickens that the bees are at the feeder and they're picking up um, particles. And so they're starved for food. They're coming out of winter. It may be that there's nothing blooming in your area. And so they will oftentimes collect things that seem to be just the right size to match a pollen grain. And so they're desperate enough to collect that, but they really don't make use of it that I'm aware of. Yeah, I've always been under the impression from other beekeepers and bee researchers that corn, corn mm -hmm. pollen, all that was, was sort of a famine food and yeah. food of last resort. Yeah. But I know Michael feeds bees and takes good care of his bees. So it's kind of curious that they would go to corn because yeah I think I mean I think that they're just looking for you know something fresh to bring home right they're desperate for spring just like I am and so I think that that's what drives them to go out looking and then it, they, I think they almost are like oh my god it's the right size right and you know it might even smell sweet to them for all I know and they get all excited um you know and and so I think it's it's more that than anything else Okay. And this, this question goes to all the research that's constantly coming out and, and it, there's a plethora of research. It's overwhelming. And mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons why I do the bee college is, is to kind of keep up on things and yeah. do some myth busting because I think myth busting is as important as learning the facts. Oh yeah. So, so here's a question. I recently read that if a bee is dancing but the other bees know there is danger at that site. They will headbutt the dancing bee to discourage communications for that site. I can't speak to that. I, I did not read that same research article, so I don't know, but um, would that be interesting? Yeah, I mean, how would they know that it's, it's a danger? Any other questions? Um, you, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question direct or put it into the chat box. Um, either way works right now. So there's been some great questions. We always like to try to stump the speaker. <laughs> um, let's see. So David Lewis talked a little bit about lemongrass in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Carolina, do you want to kind of expound on, on the whole lemongrass and some of the um, essential oils? Well, I, you know, I know there's a lot of information out there in terms of the use of essential oils, either for, um, you know, either mimicking uh, pheromones that are exuded by bees, but to be quite honest, I do not have deep knowledge. So maybe David in his presentation, he can discuss that. Um, I don't, I don't tend to, I don't tend to use, um, you know, other chemicals, but the most, I guess, necessary within the hive itself. I feel that we humans are very limited in our knowledge. And, um, and so in essence, I, I, don't, I don't play with that. I let mother nature do her thing and I only use a limited amount. And so I'm certainly not an expert in uh, the use of essential oils in the hive. Okay. And uh, David does a presentation a little bit later this afternoon. Right. And he so will, he David, will be the perfect person for that. Yep, yeah, David Lewis will be on at two o'clock. And so he will talk about feeding and some fundamental mm -hmm. equipment, but we can, it's easy to get David to talk about other things. He's an exceptionally knowledgeable beekeeper, just like Carolina. And 
So that's a good time to, that's a good person to talk to and ask questions about the essential oils and the lemongrass. And, you know, you always see people, you know, beekeepers wearing a bee beard while they've put lemongrass oil on their face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think them. the only place where I've gone in terms of the essential oils is I certainly do plant a lot of thyme um, and uh, lemon balm in and around the hives themselves in okay. my apiary. Yep. Um, it, you know, I, I, I certainly oftentimes think about the thymol products, right? And their use for varroa control. Um, and so I've certainly underplanted a lot of those areas with creeping thyme because of that. But that's the extent to which I really introduce um, other scents into the hive, so to speak. Okay, so um, one, one last question here and then we'll head off for lunch. This is from Alicia. I heard there was a f uh, phenomenon last summer that bees across the region, at least in Colorado, were making a lot of queen cells. I saw this in my own hive and didn't realize at the time it was not just my hive or local. Um, any reason for this? Maybe the weather, the wildfire, wild fire smoke. Um, I actually saw this in my hives too, where I had a lot of queen cells and it was like, what the heck's going on? And I mean, I gave them more space, you know, on the, the fear that they were going to swarm. But Carolina, did you see anything about extra queen cells in your hives or hear anything about it from? No, I certainly did not experience that in my hive, nor hives that I visit, you know, from a veterinary perspective. However, you know, one of the challenges we've definitely faced in beekeeping is that the quality of the queens that are being produced commercially um, and used in hives has certainly diminished, right? And, you know, before there was always an expectation, especially if you had a package or a nook or you had even purchased a new queen and introduced it into, her, into your hive, that certainly she was going to kick butt for the first year for sure, right? And that she might be a two or even a three season queen, right? I used to have queens that were three years old in hives that were still excellent queens. Um, and um, that those days have gone, right? It is not uncommon for you to purchase a package or, an, or a new queen introduce her to the hive and within the first month she is being replaced. Um, and so, and in some hives, certainly not replaced just once, but you're having a continuous replacement of a queen, um, you know, throughout the season. And so um, I have, um, you know, so some of it, I think, is just the queen production is poor and these queens are just not up to snuff. And I think the other aspect of it, too, is I wonder what role disease is playing in some of these hives where the queens are affected by disease and they're not performing as they should. And so even though they're brand new, right, they're being replaced because they are they are they're duds from the get go. Uh, and so that may be very disease related. Um, and then I wonder too, what the chemical um, influence is within these hives that may be affecting the performance of queens and, and um, you know, putting us in the cycle of very early queen replacement and supersedures within the hives themselves. Okay. Well, we've got Paul Anderson kind of bringing up the rear on the, on the online conference. And he has Prairie Winds beekeeping supplies. And I think Paul can address some of the queen issues that you're talking about, but I, I think you're really right about the quality of queens we're starting to see. And is sugar syrup eaten directly by the bees and or can syrup, sugar syrup be converted to honey? Mm. Um, well, they will, depending on uh, when they are being fed and what the hive's needs are, right, it may be used directly in the moment if that's what the need is, and they certainly will store it in their hive as well. 
Um, I wouldn't really call if you were only using sugar syrup, uh, you know, they will thicken it to a certain degree. They're certainly going to um, mix it with the invertase enzymes as well. But, um, you know, you're not going to be really producing honey, honey, just from uh, feeding sugar syrup. Okay. I think we'll wrap it up here. And again, this whole program is being recorded and it will be archived on the Laramie County Extension website. And I will put that in the chat box. So you can go to wyoextension.org, Laramie County. It's in the egg and hort page. And I've got two beekeeping pages in there. One is the Wyoming Beekeeping College and the other one is the Tuesday Night Beekeeping. And so one builds on the other. And again, they're archived. They're there for you to use, to go view, watch. So everything is, uh, everything is there for you to go back to. At the end of the program, I will have a evaluation for everybody to fill out. And I would certainly appreciate that. If you would do that, that helps what I do and it helps steer me for future programming. But right now we're gonna take a lunch break. I will see everybody back here at 1230.